I think that that's really what that what that is. Both those are about sharing um, and you know finding ways to share. Um, oh my gosh, look at that. Yes, okay, terrific. I think our program is going to begin soon. So uh, you won't need to listen to me uh, pretend that we're on radio here. So, uh, and uh, you know, oh, I know, yes. Yes, Dan has arrived. Hi. Take it away, I'm gonna mute myself, Dan. Okay. Let me load in here. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. I'm really happy to be here, and um, I apologize for for um, I apologize for um, being late to the show, and hope I can make it up to you. So um, today I'm going to talk. You know, it is so hard to give a talk these days because everything just changes minute by minute. It seems like the snow globe gets turned upside down every couple of hours. And just as we think things are kind of settling down and we can start making plans, then, then everything changes again. And that's kind of the personal lived experience that I think each of us is feeling, but it's really part of something that's, that's not new. Right now we're being inundated by, by um, you know, crises that have been long standing. We've had, a, we've had a health crisis and a health access crisis for a very long time. And we've had an equity crisis and a problem with police killing black people and, and a legacy of colonialism that has, that has caused problems for Americans since the get go. And of course we have an economic crisis and an and inequity crisis and problems in that space that have been growing, you know, that have been there for a long time and certainly have been growing since, you know, 1972, whatever. Um, the interesting thing is that all of these have come together now into one big super crisis that is really drawing our attention and has made us realize that really things have to change now. And there's, at, this has happened at the same time that there's a demographic revolution happening where the largest generation in human history is, is moving into a new part of their lives at the same time that the second largest generation in human history, the millennials, is actually becoming the largest. And, and that's because even though there were not as many millennials born as baby boomers, um, some of the baby boomers have died and the millennials haven't really started dying in numbers yet. And so we've got more millennials than boomers. And, and, and so that demographic, that demographic change is also being matched by a change in what people look like. And at this point in time, I believe the numbers are something like 36% of American, sorry, let me talk about Californians. 36% of Californians are uh, non-Hispanic whites, 39% Latinos, um, and then an admixture of other ethnicities. And, and those, all of these changes are really profound and really tremendous. And in trying to think about what to talk to you about today that really kind of catches those, I realized that I just really need to not, I need to not not focus so much on the little details that are gonna be obsolete by the time this talk is done, but really talk about the big picture of what CNPS is doing and why we're doing it and how it makes a difference over the course of months and years and decades in a way that doesn't vary based on who is president at any given time or what the headlines are this week. And so that's the talk that I'm gonna give you here today. I'm hoping that I can get through it really fast um, raise some ideas, and then hopefully we have a little bit of time afterwards to, to have some discussion. That's really what I want to get out of this, is, is hearing, hearing what you are thinking at this point. Okay, so I'm very fortunate to be able to work for the California Native Plant Society. It's a fantastic organization, 35 chapters in California, in Baja California, Mexico. We've got something like, you know, 11, 12,000 paying members, but really we have more like 100,000 supporters, people who lead field trips, are garden ambassadors, give talks, um, go out and do rare plant treasure hunts, um, tell their neighbors how to grow native plants, people who identify as CNPSers. In fact, probably most of them actually think they're members, but um, haven't actually got around to sending in their membership checks. So we're an interesting organization. Most of what we get done is done by volunteers and by folks working within chapters. In addition to that, we've got um, three dozen staff, mostly plant scientists, 
who really are there to serve, serve and support the volunteers in the chapters and add a little bit more. So as the executive director who supervises the staff, I'm gonna talk a lot about what staff are doing, but please keep in mind that as I talk through this stuff, we're talking about, when I say we, I mean the royal, I, I mean not the royal we, I mean kind of actually the opposite. When I say we, I mean everyone except me. When I take, when I say that we have done something fantastic, I, I my job is to, is to talk about the good work that others have been doing. So please um, appreciate that I'm not claiming credit for any of this. Instead, I'm celebrating successes that others have made possible. So let me, there we go, we can advance. And before I get into that, I do wanna get into, you know, much of what I'm gonna talk about here today is about big picture change. As I said, things are changing fast and there's tremendous opportunities and I do wanna talk about that. But I also wanna talk about it within a very big picture and, and have the kind of perspective that that brings. And for folks in our area, for folks in Redbud and in Sacramento, that big picture started around, you know, 1840, in the late 1840s, when the whole world changed. And, and the region was inundated by Americans and Europeans and folks from all over the world in search of gold. Prior to that, California was still largely dominated by the people who had lived there for a thousand generations, for something like, you know, perhaps 13,000 years. And in the Redbud chapter area, that was the Nisin and Maidu. And these numbers are kind of pulled out, their best guesses and everything. But you can do a comparison. In 1840, the majority of the population was native. And that, that, little, that little bit that you see there is, is immigrants. That has changed and transformed radically in the years since, to where the native populations are, are dramatically um, outnumbered. Um, in, by folks who have moved into California. And so I think this is an interesting part of context that you know, we're all more or less aware of, but, I, but I, don't, I wanna talk about it a little bit more because the time frame here is actually very short. It's really interesting to me. When I look at a graph like this and I see some of the events that I think of as being important. So on this, you can see a graph of the population of Sacramento, California from 1850 to 2018 that, you know, we, we probably won't have numbers for 2020 because I guess we decided not to do a census this time around or something. Um, sorry. Um, and so that, that red dot on the bottom, you know, let me see if I can indicate it with my mouse. That red dot indicates when the Library of Congress was built in Washington, DC, 1897. The green dot shows when Jake Sig was born. Jake Sig is a friend. He's the person who introduced me to CNPS really. Uh, when I was a questing young male in San Francisco in 1990, trying to figure out what to do with my life, I bumped into this guy who said, hey, you should uh, help remove weeds from these remaining natural areas in San Francisco to help save what actually is the highest density of endangered species in, in the Americas. And uh, so, so Jake Sig was born in 1927 on a Montana sheep farm. I'm guessing the guy probably didn't even see a car until he was enlisted in World War II and shipped off to San Francisco. So that's that's just, you know, just 30 years after they built the Library of Congress, Jake Sig was born in a completely different era, completely different world. This yellow dot is when the California Native Plant Society was formed in 1965. And then the blue dot is um, when I met Jake Sig in San Francisco. And so in this little arc, it's basically a single human's, you know, it's very much like a single human's lifespan. This this tremendous change in population that we've seen is almost knowable by an individual who grew up in a Montana sheep farm closer to when the Library of Congress was built and, and now is still alive today fighting for native plants. And, and so much has changed in those times. People, our society has changed, our culture has changed, but individuals haven't. Jake Sig is still the same person who was born on a Montana sheep farm in, in 1927. And he's living in a world that is fundamentally different. And so I think all of these things give me a sense of perspective about what we're doing and what it means and, and forgiveness and patience for each other. And also hope that the, the traumas and the craziness of today will be just a blip on the larger maps that, we, that people look back at tomorrow. On, a, on an even more personal perspective, this is part of why I'm working for CNPS, what has drawn me to this field and what I am fighting for. And these are two little towns next to where I grew up. I grew up in Fallbrook, California, middle of nowhere, east of Camp Pendleton, the northernmost community in San Diego County. No one's ever been there. The closest I get is people say, oh, I saw a sign saying this exit for Fallbrook on Highway 15. When I grew up, 
Temecula was a little town. There was nothing there. I'm not sure there was even a gas station. You didn't want to get a flat tire there. The population was something like this, you know, 1,700 people. And that's probably pretty generous. That's over a very large area. And in the, I remember vividly in the, in the late 80s and the 90s when they started building a new city there. They just, it was like they were just painting it down, um, building huge numbers of units. And you can see that in this graph where the, the, the construction and the development of, of sprawl housing in Temecula just went up exponentially until it more or less leveled out. The same thing happened in the adjacent community. Time shifted by a decade. They got started in Temecula, did 10 years of work, started, um, you know, started finishing Temecula, and then they started Murrieta, and the same thing happened. And as you can see, it shows the same kind of growth curve. And this is what sprawl development in California does. This is, it's like a fungus growing on a Petri dish where it covers all the available surface area until it has saturated it and then it levels out. And this is what Temecula looked like when I was a kid. You, if you were, we would go through, we would drive through Temecula and you basically hope you don't run out of gas or get a flat tire because there isn't a lot of help around. This is an older photo, but it looked this way in the seventies. And this is how it started looking in the eighties. They started putting in these developments. And now this is what Temecula looks like today. This is what's there now, um, as you can see. I think we've all seen this and experienced this sprawl development and the, in the, the rate at which humans can take over habitat in California. We can do it faster than we can think about whether we should. And this is what Temecula looks like from space. Um, this is, you know, remember when I was a kid, all of this was nothing. It was all um, what is today endangered kangaroo, hab kangaroo rat habitat. It, it looked more like this. And so, for me, this is, this is really important. That This is what drove me to be a conservationist, to try and save some of these wild places for future generations. And so now I'm gonna talk about what the threats are to our biodiversity and our wild places. And I'm gonna talk about things that correlate well with human population density. And it needs to be said that population today, the way we live, where we sprawl across the environment and we spread out and we have extremely high resource consumption, population is a very big problem. It doesn't have to be. We can live differently. We can live at higher density. We can have lower resource consumption. And in that case, population isn't as big a problem. But the way we're doing it today, population is a problem. I hope that we can change our lifestyle patterns and live in such a way that we can have more humans and have an actually, actually have a lower impact on our planet. And I, I'm really hopeful for that because humans are great. They do interesting stuff and crazy stuff. And when you pack humans together and you get them interacting with each other elbow to elbow and they can talk to each other and see each other's art and play music for one another and change their music, you can have cultural innovation and you just have so much excitement um, and, uh, and you have so much of what is good about humans. More humans really gives you more beautiful stuff, but we can't do it at, ex at the expense of the biosphere. So the things that correlate with population density are um, habitat loss due to development. This is, a, this is a painting that I found in a junk shop in San Francisco back when there were junk shops in San Francisco. And on the back of it, the painting says, Poppies on Mount Tam, 1937, uh, 1934. Um, three years before the Golden Gate Bridge was built, someone took a boat across the water and got on horseback and got into Marin and painted this painting of Mount Tam. And it, you can kind of see some of the blush of poppies in this, it kind of shows. The painting was pretty dirty. And this is what Mount Tam looked like in 2005. This is habitat loss due to development. And when humans build something on habitat, we take it away from the things that were living there before and we impact their ability to survive and even the ability for the species to persist. That's the number one threat to biodiversity in California, habitat loss due to development. The number two threat is biological invasions. And this is an aerial photograph of the Laguna Niguel Regional Park in Orange County. And as you can see, it, it was a park full of beautiful oak trees. You can see each of these little oak trees. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but they, these are the oak trees that, you know, the abuelas would sit under while their kids played soccer and it just made it a wonderful park. This was in 2014. This is 2016, same park without the oak trees. This is after the polyphagous shot hole borer invaded this park and liquid, liquefied the oak trees in the blink of an eye and they wound up having to cut them down and chip them. And so this is, you know, it's a fundamentally different place. So biological invasions, when we introduce organisms from elsewhere on the planet, um, and they are not subject to the natural regulation that they have back where they came from, this kind of thing happens. 
And, and this is a function of human population density. The more of us that there are moving around uh, with mud on our boots and seeds in our pockets, the more chance that we're gonna introduce something harmful. So biological invasions is, you know, be it diseases um, as we're seeing right now, um, or pests or invasive plants, biological invasions are the number two threat to biodiversity. And then the number three threat is at any scale. These, these, these are the same trends, whether you're talking worldwide or just in our county or in California or North America. The third threat is, um, is pollution. And you know we're well aware of the impacts of acid rain on natural systems, and we're, we've had successes at cleaning up that kind of pollution. We're increasingly aware of the effects of, um, envir of you know, um, ubiquity of synthetic pesticides in the environment and the impacts that they have on the creatures we're sharing this planet with. In, in particular, neonic neonics are looking quite harmful and, and are actually causing loss of, not just of the pollinators that we depend on for our food, but really of, of biomass of insects, of, of, a, of the whole fundamental branch of the tree of life. Is, is being heavily impacted by the degree to which we have um, saturated our environment with trace amounts of crazy chemicals. And then of course, there are other forms of pollution that we're concerned about these days. Um, pollution of our atmosphere with greenhouse gas chemicals is having substantial impacts. We're going to see very substantial sea level rise and we're going to see, we are seeing an increase in the intensity and the frequency and the severity of fires. And, and many other factors that result from that third biggest threat to biodiversity, pollution. And of course, these all interact. Right now, the second largest fire in, in California history is burning um, up the LNU complex fire up in La Napa Lake Calusa counties. It started right on a site that we are going to be suing to stop a development, uh, 25 square miles of serpentine that they're gonna put a bunch of billionaire resort houses on three heliports on that site. And the, it's interesting that the fire actually started, when it started, I was emailing back and forth with people who were criticizing the fact that we pointed out um, fire risk, fire hazards, and the lack of ingress, egress as problems with the project. And, and we were being told, you know, I was arguing with someone who was saying that, you know, th those aren't plant related, we shouldn't be even worrying about them. And at that moment, I got a text from a board member who had gotten an alert that a very small fire had broken out right on our project site. And that's turned into this giant fire. And that giant fire is transforming the region. That is part of an ongoing set of fires in that region along Hobby 20 um, that is transforming gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous um, oak woodland and oak forest and riparian forest into European annual grass wastelands. And so fire in California, you know, it's important to point it out in your lawsuits because it has a lot more power with the judge than, than rare plants. Um, but it also is a plant issue because we are transforming our biodiverse plant habitats into low diversity, highly flammable uh, European annual grasslands. And that is an interaction of biological invasions and, and the consequences of greenhouse gas emissions, pollution, um, and the effects on climate change. And so these things do interact synergistically. Um, and, um, and so today we're facing choices on how to deal with these threats. And so this is gonna get into the, what we're doing to fix the problem part of the talk. So we are literally right now making choices. We have people making plans for California, 99 million acres, and we are planning what we are going to do with it. And we are making the deliberate choice. Are we going to make any given part of California? We are choosing right now, is it going to look like this? or is it going to look like this? And it is not an exaggeration. These are the choices that we are making. And when we, in our homes and in our built environment, we are making choices about whether the landscape that we live in is going to look like this. This is my kid out on a, on a, on a she ran out and yelled, this is the worst front yard in the world or the worst garden in the world. Do we want our yards to look like that or do we want them to look like this, biodiverse, pollinator supporting, drought fighting, low chemical use, um, low maintenance, uh, native plant gardens. We're making those choices today. Some choices we have made, it is the law now that California will be 100% renewable energy by 2045. And also that uh, um, we will be zero net emissions by 2045. So we've decided that, we made that choice, that's the law. But there's details that we're working out. This is the Northern end of Carrizo Plain. We are trying to decide whether incredible places like that 
are are they going to help us in reaching the 100% renewable part of the law, or are they going to help us on the zero net emissions? Are they going to be generating electricity? Are we going to cover Carrizo Plain with solar panels like this to generate electricity towards 100% renewable, or are we going to keep them intact towards sequestering carbon and helping us to achieve the zero net emissions? These are choices that we are all making today. And then when it comes to fire, we're making choices. We're choosing whether to live with fire like this, which is to say, devastate the landscape with our, our fuel management and still lose our homes because, uh, because you know, a structure built out of trees that have been dead for many decades is always going to be more flammable than, than trees that are living. And so you've seen photos like this before where the house is burned down, but you have, but you have trees intact. You'll even have pine trees looking you know, slightly crisped up, but still alive right next to a burned out house. Um, are we going to live with fire in this kind of a way, an expensive, harmful way, or are we going to live with it in this kind of way where we acknowledge that, this, that you know, the laws of thermodynamics require things to burn and we're not going to fight them forever. And instead we're going to live with fire in a way that, that is safer and less expensive for us and also um, um, uh, better and uh, better for our natural system and, and actually keeps them resilient in the face of other changes that they're facing. So these are the choices that we're facing. And as you know, California Native Plant Society has been working on this stuff for a long time. We've all kind of made our decisions a long time ago. Um, I'm preaching to the choir here. I think we all know what the right choices are in this and we're actually trying to convince other people, but something has changed. People have been, you know, people have heard us and others over the years. And now people, Californians, Americans are, are joining us in a, in a way that they haven't before. And they are literally out in the street demanding that we make the, the right choices. They're, they're out in the streets literally demanding that their decision makers, that the politicians they elect, listen to science. We're having marches for science where thousands and tens of thousands of people hit the streets and demand that we make rational science-based choices. And when you do that, the politicians listen, not all of them, obviously, but most of them are good folks, especially in California where we've got a really good team. And when you pressure them, you give them the excuse to do what they wanna do. They, most of them want to do the right thing. They just, you know, they also wanna keep their job. And so they need us um, out there being vocal and telling them that we've made our decision and we want them to make the right choices. Um, and so, um, so to talk a little bit about how we're doing that, um, I'm gonna, you know, as I mentioned, we are literally planning the future of California right now. And this, this map is a little bit of a placeholder. Um, it says ongoing regional planning projects. So it's just to indicate uh, by example, the kind of planning that we're doing. There's actually a lot more regional planning projects of all sorts that are going on right now. But we've got, you know, as you can see in dark green, the, the US Forest Service is revising their forest plans and we are, we are working with them on that. Um, We've got 26 million acres of California desert is being, the future of it is being planned within the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan, a plan that will last for 30 years, which is to say that whatever we do within that plan will be what happens to the desert forever. Um, whatever we bulldoze in the next 30 years, you know, if we bulldoze it in the next 30 years, it's going to stay bulldozed. And if we, if we save it, it's probably going to save that. That 30 year horizon is kind of the, the horizon of determination. And you've got the same story on and on. Um, Southern San Joaquin Valley, um, all these large scale regional planning projects that we're engaged in. And, and so it's really an incredible opportunity to weigh in on this stuff. And most of these are being done with good intentions by people of good faith who genuinely want to make it work out. They genuinely, you know, even the developers want to know where it's okay for them to develop. They want, if we can tell them those areas are okay, we're not gonna fight you over those, these areas are not okay to build on, we will fight you over them. It really does, you know, it really helps us um, uh, work toward a better future. And so engaging in these planning processes is critically important. And an another opportunity that we have had is the California Biodiversity Initiative. And the California Native Plant Society has played a huge role in helping structure this, in helping get this thing going. And this started in 2000. 17, I'm losing track of years nowadays, um, in September when Governor Brown called a couple dozen scientists into his office and strongly suggested that we put together a charter 
for um, native plant conservation that he could bring to the podium at the Global Climate Action Summit and show that California is um, acting to save its biodiversity, kind of make it the, the other big issue, climate change and biodiversity. And, um, and so we put together a charter to secure the future of California's biodiversity. He liked it and, and requested an action plan from us. And so we put together a roadmap, kind of a 30,000 foot overview of how we would achieve um, an effort to secure the future of California's biodiversity. And this is that roadmap. Subsequently, he passed several executive orders around biodiversity, uh, mandating that, for example, that, that commitment to go 100% renewable, zero net emissions by 2045, we shall accomplish that without harming um, rare plants, wildlife, and biodiversity and human communities. That was an executive order, and that's a big deal for us to have that actually in the commitment. Um, and so the biodiversity initiative has been, we've been building momentum on it for a couple of years. It is now essentially the law of the land. Executive orders require all state agencies to work on conserving California's biodiversity to be led by the Department of Fish and Wildlife representing resources and by the California Department of Food Agriculture. And, um, and we've, we have made tremendous progress on it. And we were poised uh, for some really big wins uh, when this whole COVID thing hit and scrambled the world. And so we're now, you know, I've, I've used the snow globe metaphor where it got turned upside down and we're waiting for things to settle so we can figure out, you know, which way to go. We know where we're going with the biodiversity initiative. Prior to this, we were, we were um, having good success getting a funding request into the resilience bond that would have provided an in incredible amount of money to support biodiversity work in California, um, uh, to support, to basically build a core of individual scientists, volunteers, community members, conservation core types to go and collect specimens of all of California's biodiversity to secure specimens and, and bring that information into fine scale planning for how to conserve it. And really the intent there was to secure the biodiversity that we have, get the data that we need, and in the course of it, revolutionize who is doing biodiversity conservation in California. Because it's a biodiversity hotspot, one of 35 on planet Earth, with more plants than any other state, and you know, with 25% of the plants that occur north of Baja, uh, north of Mexico, um, you, you need a huge workforce to do it. And so that is our excuse for providing access and opportunity to folks who've traditionally been excluded from conservation work. So that the future of conservation, you know, by the time we are done mapping California's biodiversity and collecting specimens, we will have trained up a whole new workforce. And the future of conservation in California looks substantially different from what it looks like today. That was our intent. Um, we were reasonably certain that we were going to get that money, almost $200 million in the resilience bond. And then everything turned upside down and the bond got canceled. Um, we know that there will be future opportunities, whether they are stimulus funds coming from the federal government, or whether they are a resilience bond in a year or two, or, or whether it's a different bond, a workforce bond. It all works fine for us because our effort brings all of those things together. It is a Green New Deal effort. It stimulates the economy. It is workforce development and job training, and it is biodiversity conservation. It's all of those things brought together. And the way that we have seen all of these long simmering, festering crises merge together into the super crisis, we are bringing together these elements of what we have to do to save biodiversity into one super solution. And so we're right now we're working on what we gotta work on while we wait to see exactly what the path forward is. We know where we're going. We just don't know whether we're going around the hill that way or around the hill that way, but we know where we're going. And so um, I'm going to speed past some of these. I'm going to actually, I'll go, I'll go very quickly through this stuff to tell you what California Native Plant Society is doing within this. We're mapping the vegetation of California so that we know what we have. We've been doing this for about 20 years. Julie Evans started, I believe, 2000, April of 2001. And for me, that kind of marks the beginning. We had to, you know, obviously, and this is the global we. I had no role in it. CNPS had a huge role, but it was, there were many others working on this um, to define vegetation science, to develop standards that cohere with the national standards, which integrate with the global standards, to um, classify our vegetation, to develop ordination methodologies for doing the classification, and then to write the books about this you know, write the book and then write the other book and then teach workshops so that people knew how to do this. And then finally get out there and be mapping stuff. And in that time, just in a couple of decades, we've mapped 
almost half the state at some level. And that's pretty incredible. So we've done a great job of mapping the vegetation of California. And one of our commitments is to finish making that map and then pull the data together to identify which of those natural communities are rare and develop a really robust map of the rare natural communities of California. At the same time, we do it, and, 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 this, and this is a map showing the areas that we have, that we, the, we've mapped as of 2012. I need an updated map. Uh, but this shows the areas that we've done vegetation mapping. And again, the global we. At the same time, we've been mapping rare plants. And you know, California is a biodiversity hotspot with more plants than any other state. We actually have more rare plants than most states even have plants. And to find these things, you need a huge workforce. And so when we find a big data gap, um, we, we, need, we need help in finding out whether those plants are actually there or the plants that were reported to be there actually are that plant, that kind of thing. And so CNPS developed the rare plant treasure hunts in which we train volunteers to go out and find rare plants. And it basically takes advantage of the fact that all humans can recognize plants at some level. Those humans who couldn't recognize plants either starved to death or poisoned and they didn't leave as many descendants. And we are the descendants of humans who can recognize plants. So rare plant treasure hunts are organized systems in which rare plant scientists working for CNPS go out, recruit volunteers, train them to recognize the plants we're looking for at this site and then set them loose. And in, in five years, they found 2,500 populations of rare plants. About a third of those were new discoveries. So we're finding rare plants um, and, um, and, and yeah, anyway, so that's an important part of trying to figure out what we have. It's, it's you know, shameful and surprising that we, California really is not well mapped. Whenever we go out and look, we find new stuff, oftentimes new species. It's critical that we get this data so that we can identify which areas are most important for saving. What are the, what pieces of California are critical as parts of our biodiversity portfolio? We, um, and, and so, um, and this fits into our important plant areas initiative that integrates with the global standards on important plant areas. Although our system for doing it is much more data driven. The global system for IPAs is focused more on expert opinion, but we're a science-based organization. So we've structured our system to require, re rely on really you know, defensible data in a substantial way. And so we basically bring in all the bot botanical data that we can secure, the rare plant locations, the rare vegetation information. Um, we, we go out and interview uh, local experts to get the information that's in their heads or on their hard drives or wherever it might be and pull all of those data together, um, put them into some really smart computers to identify basically to rank every square kilometer of California in terms of its botanical importance. Every square kilometer gets a rank. And then where you have a cluster of high ranked areas, you have an important plant area. And so that's, that's you know, the hand wavy explanation for our important plant areas initiative. It's basically a giant, giant data layer, a module that is being deliberately built to insert into other efforts. It inserts into the ACE3 that CDFW is doing. It inserts into NCCPs and HCPs. It inserts into all of those regional planning processes. Um, it inserts into all of these efforts in which people come to CNPS and say, we're doing, you know, we're doing a big planning effort. We want to avoid the areas that you care about. Give us a map. And at this point in time, we simply can't do that. We don't have those maps. And that's why we're taking on the IPA initiative to finally, once and for all, figure out what we have, where our conservation priorities are, um, and let the world know that um, which areas we're willing to compromise over and which areas they can expect CNPS to fight uh, to save. So the IPA initiative. Um, at the same time, we're doing some backup. We're doing, um, and you know, one important part of the backup is the California plant rescue. And that is an effort to collect seeds from all of California's rare plants as a hedge against extinction. This does not, this is not enough. It does not save the wild populations in the wild, but it's something that we can do fairly cheap. It's fairly cheap for humans to collect seeds comparatively, you know, compared to buying acreage and restoring landscape, getting scientists and volunteers out there to responsibly collect seeds of rare plants is pretty doable. doable. Again, it's paleolithic technology. We are all the descendants of humans who knew how to collect seeds. And so this is an, this is an effort that we've been doing with a number of partners for a decade or so, um, doing you know six collections a year, 12 collections, bit by bit, working our way toward collecting 2,500 species um, that occur in 50,000 different sites. Um, and it got a big shot in the arm, um, thanks to the Biodiversity Initiative, 
we were able to go to the legislature and ask for funding to support seed collection in California. We secured $3.6 million to fully seed bank all of California's rare plants. Um, and that's something that came out of the biodiversity initiative that we helped to launch. And so the NPS, this is where the we gets a little bit smaller. In that, we was CNPS talking to legislatures, making the case, and getting that money secured. That was our lobbying team, our staff, talking to specific legislators, educating them, and getting them on board, and then them carrying the water, people like Ash Kalra, fighting to get that funding. $3.6 million is a tremendous amount of funding for an effort like ours. We are not used to funding like that. For the legislature, it's not an insane amount of money. It's pretty doable. They just really needed us to, to push them to do it. And to be clear, that funding goes to a coalition of entities doing the work. Universities, botanic gardens, nonprofits. We've got, I think it's probably a dozen to 20 different entities that are out there doing that. And they get reimbursed for their seed collection. CNPS is one of those entities, but this was not CNPS lobbying for money for CNPS. We actually didn't expect that we would be getting any of the money. And as it turns out, we're doing some of the collections. So we're getting a little bit, um, but, um, but this was CNPS um, doing what we do well, which is really to be something of a platform that supports all of our partners and advances our mission by, by helping others do it so that we don't have to do it ourselves. We strengthen our partners. Um, we grow their capacity, the work gets done, and we get more done than CNPS could get done if we were doing it just ourselves. And so I'm pretty proud of how the California Plant Rescue is going and the role that we've had in really moving it forward. It's a big deal to say that you have seed banked all of the rare plants for one of Earth's 35 biodiversity hotspots. That's a big deal to say that you ended plant extinction in California. I know that's hyperbolic, not exactly ended it, but having those seeds in a refrigerator is a lot better than not having them. And, 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 and that will be done by us. So you can feel proud about that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit quickly about what we're doing going forward. We're moving the biodiversity initiative forward, as you know, as I told you about. We're also advancing the habitat revolution. And this is a really big one. This basically is just premised on the fact that we have tremendous opportunity throughout California to improve habitat where we live, to restore nature one garden at a time. And here's just a little collage of bad gardens. You probably have plenty of photos of your own. Um, you know, I really love this is landscape upgrade in progress uh, with you know just tons of trash and everything. Um, so that's where we are today and this is where we need to go. California needs to be filled with beautiful habitat gardens that, you know, save, that fight the drought, reduce chemical use, reduce landfill waste, reduce maintenance, um, benefit pollinators and wildlife, and give us a chance to reconnect with nature. As the father of a little kid, I grew up. I grew up on a farm, and my kids growing up in the city. And I oftentimes, you know, have worried about the experience that she has. And then we'll go walking along, and and we'll pass a native plant garden in someone's front yard. And the I remember one time we passed, you know, big beautiful black sage, and just absentmindedly the kid reached out and just grabbed one of the branches and pulled along, you know, ran her hand, ran it through her hand, you know, through the flowers and pulled her hand to her to her nose and sniffed it. Just like you gotta do when you pass one of those things. Um, she wasn't thinking about it or trying to show something to me, um, but it really drove home to me how important our native plant gardens can be and the way that they can really help all of us to connect with the nature that that resets something in our body, that resets our neurochemistry at a fundamental level. It just makes us ha healthier and happier people. And so that's the habitat revolution. The idea that where someone is planting something, they don't care what they're planting, it should be local native. Um, the default landscaping palette should be local natives because the benefits are huge. And the expense of them is, 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 you know, and they're just more efficient. You don't have to trim them as much. You don't got to fertilize them. Uh, you don't got to water as much. It's just the way it should be and we're ready for it. Um, we have spent decades talking about native plant gardening with our neighbors and educating people. And at this point in time, people get it. Water districts are requiring it. Municipalities are sending out flyers. This is our opportunity. And the special value added that CNPS brings that, that really no other group is bringing is this understanding of the value of local, that each place has its own native plants that the California poppy that grows on, you know, that grows um, in wild areas near your home 
is a different poppy from the one that grows on the other side of the mountain range. The, the tar plant on this side of the valley is a different tar plant. Even though they're the same species, they are different on different sides of the valley. And, and we find this when we get caterpillars from one tar plant and we move it onto the other side of the valley. You know, we bring Bruce Baldwin and Jimmy Crimmel have done some really interesting work where you get the same species of tar plant from opposite sides of the valley. You find that there's a, a, a moth that is a specialist on that species of tar plant and you grow them in a common garden and you move them off to different location tar plants and they starve to death. They just can't eat the non-local tar plant. There are, there are webs of connectivity and relationships that we simply cannot see that are critically important. And so you someday we will understand them better. I do not believe we will ever understand them fully. It is something that is beautifully unknowable and really, um, what, and, and in order to do right today and not make things worse, we can follow a very simple principle that local is good. And so Habitat Revolution is part of that. Um, and we're and in the Habitat Revolution, we're working with water districts across Southern California, now with the Metropolitan Water District with 16 million customers um, to, to advance this. And this is a big initiative that we're moving forward now. Um, we're upgrading the CalScape plant database, which now has like a million users a year. Um, we're, we're overhauling that. Um, we're doing it, putting out a bid, an RFP for contractors to bid for a complete overhaul so that it that it is up to the task that millions of Californians are now turning to CalScape uh, to accomplish. Uh, so you'll hear more about the Habitat Revolution. We want to hear more about how you think we, uh, how, how we can best advance it. Um, we're also doing, you know, restoring nature in other ways. The, the Reoak initiative that, that we um, joined in on a couple years ago has been very successful. Um, I think we planted 28,000 acorns in that first, 28,000 oaks in that first year, saplings. Um, acorns collected by volunteers from across California. They would go out, collect the acorns, um, fill out a data sheet uh, that marks the location of the tree, include a twig so that we can identify the species of the tree, and then volunteers from Sac Valley chapter sorted the acorns, cleaned, cleaned and rinsed them um, uh, with a bleach solution to surface sterilize them and prevent phytophthora and other diseases. Um, and, then, and, then we, and then we grew them, again, 28,000 saplings, um, some of them grown by the CMPS nursery in Sonoma with uh, the Miley Low Baker chapter and Betty Young leading that effort and others grown uh, by a commercial nursery who could grow them at scale. And then we sent them back out and we sent these plants out back to the same area from which the acorns were collected. We were careful to not mix them around. We were careful to maintain the genetic population structure of the acorns that we received. And so plants going to a site were grown from acorns that came from that site. And that is something somewhat new. And it was a logistic challenge, but it was completely doable. And it allowed us to demonstrate the principle of growing and planting local at scale. This was a statewide effort that did tens of thousands of plants in a rush in just one season. Um, and it was a fantastic, you know, it will result in many beautiful oak trees. And it also was a great test of, of, uh, of you know, do, going local. So, you know, in spite of all that we're doing, some things are going to change no matter what. There are some things that we just can't fix. And this slide is meant to demonstrate that. This is a slide showing the global distribution of Leptosiphon crocium, the coast yellow Leptosiphon, um, a beautiful little um, Lyanthus kind of thing um, that grows in coastal San Mateo that Tony Corelli um, put together a petition, petition to list it as, uh, as uh, California endangered. It occurs here now. It used to occur on coastal bluffs all along the central coast of San Francisco and San Mateo, and they are all gone now. We've done stuff to those bluffs. It occurs here. There's some plants here and, and a small population here. And the scale on this is ridiculous. This is, if a person were standing out there, they'd probably blot out that dot. Um, and, and so this plant is facing multiple threats. It's facing sea level rise. These, these yellow and red lines that you see show the future, the projected future coastline in just a few short decades. These coasts, this, these bluffs are going to erode. Um, we've also got giant populations of ice plant here that are moving in on in, in on our plant. And then we've got trails. This is county land. This is a county park. There's, they actually put a park bench right here. People walk their dogs along here and sit on the bench and look at the view. Um, and, and we've got storyboards for four houses going in right here. 
So no matter what we do, we stop the houses, we get the, the bench out of there, it still won't save the plant because it'll be inundated by ice plant and then pulled into the sea. And so there are things that we have to do. We have to conserve these things in complicated ways. Um, and so, you know, that is the crux of our problem. That is conservation in California today. Um, and and it's, it is quite a challenge. And, and it's just, you know, I guess I'll, I'll speed forward to kind of the closing here. Um, my take home here is that this work is all pretty doable. The stuff that you've talked about has been done by grassroots nonprofit and, and poorly socialized botanists and dedicated volunteers with very little support against great odds in, in a world where there's a lot of other stuff going on. And yet we've had tremendous successes. We've saved California. We've saved half of California's lands are now permanently protected. They're not all managed the way we would want, but they're protected. And that's a big deal in a place with, with real estate values like we have here. We've to a large degree ended plant extinction. Even though we have more rare plants than any other state, more plants, more rare plants than most states have plants. We have so much to lose as we've you know, built, paved over our cities and, and grown food for the nation. Um, of those 2,500 plants, we've, we've only lost something like 21. And I say something like, because when we go out and look, we actually rediscover them sometimes. And we quite often discover new plants. We've lost too many populations. We've lost too much, but we haven't lost as much as we should have. And that's because fundamentally, these things are built to survive. They've been here for a very long time. And, and even though our efforts have been underfunded and we've been under-resourced and we've been figuring it out, we've been figuring out how to do it um, as we've gone through this. And we've been making, you know, as a civilization, we've made some stupid mistakes that we won't make again. In spite of all of that, we have a lot to be proud of and we have a lot of successes. And it's still, most of what was there is still there. And, and we, we, we still can succeed at saving this place. But in order to do it, we really need to share the opportunity. We need to make sure that everyone has a chance to be a part of it. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a moral imperative. This is, this is the most satisfying work that you can have. Saving, saving portions of the creation, getting out there and discovering rare plants, um, even sitting in late night county supervisor hearings fighting to save a place. It is really fulfilling work and everyone has a chance. Everyone deserves the chance to be a part of it. Um, and then just logistically, it's, it's a lot of work and we need everyone to be involved. And so that's really, you know, that's I think one of the biggest challenges that we are facing now is how to bring all of California in on this work. How to make sure that everyone has the opportunity, um, not necessarily that everyone knows everything and is fully aware and that this is the number one thing that they care about, but that that, you know, to be honest, that conservation in California looks very different, that it, re that it benefits from the diversity of ideas that are out there and the diversity of life experiences. And that, you know, as we try to scale up the habitat revolution and plant millions of native plants, that they are grown in a way that, um, that we just aren't doing now, that they are grown by people who, you know, come from a family that has grown tomato plants every year. You know, I, I, I think of the folks at Bowles Family Farming who on, um, you know, they have a dirt road running through their farm. On one side of the dirt road is a habitat restoration project put in by Audubon California and TNC, uh, where PhDs who look like me were on their hands and knees planting expensive gallon plants of willows and everything else. And on the other side of the dirt road is 400,000 tomato plants that were planted by folks who've worked for bulls for decades and generations. And those tomato plants were grown for a penny each and planted for pennies each. And these, it's really interesting talking to the, the Bulls folks, pointing to the two sides of the road, um, saying, you know, we can do re that restoration work really cheap. And, and I think of them being part of the solution for growing local native plants and getting them out onto the landscape at a scale that, that we just haven't been able to. This is what we need. This is why we need to expand the folks joining it. And then, as I said, it is just fundamentally um, uh, um, there, there's an element of morality to it, that this is, this is the finest work that one can do, that, that saving, saving what we have for future generations is, is just fantastically satisfying and everyone deserves a chance to be part of it. Um, so, um, uh, I guess to close, 
um, I want to talk about where we've come. This was the first plant sale, the first CNPS plant sale. When the chapter decided, when CNPS decided that it needed to save plants across California and it would take money, um, there was a brainstorming session of, well, how are we going to get money? And someone said, well, I, I'm growing a bunch of plants in my backyard in pots. Um, I can, we can sell them. And someone else said, hey, me too. They brought them all together. The thing sold out in an hour. And thus the tradition was born. And so plant sales in CNPS are much more than just supporting chapter activities. They're much more than just providing the money that we give in scholarships to make sure that there's a generation of scientists that can do this work. They are a chance to be ambassadors to our neighbors and to evangelize, evangel to, to spread the gospel of California native plants. And, and it has worked. Um, I've told you about our successes. Here's a chart that shows the number of native plants in each state in California, 50, 50 bars. The one on the left is the number of native plants in California. We've got more plants than any other state in the union. That other red bar, somewhere in the middle, is California rare plants. That's the approximate number of plants that we have that are rare. And as you can see, we've got more rare plants than most states have plants. It's a tremendous wealth, it's a tremendous blessing and a, and a huge responsibility. When we fight to save California plants, we're doing, we're not just saving something that we love, which is why we're doing it. But in doing so, we're saving something that is globally important, that is fundamental to making California one of 35 biodiversity hotspots on planet Earth. And as far as other successes, I mentioned that we've saved 50% of our natural areas, that 50% of California is permanently protected. And this is, that's what this map shows. And that's, you know, some of it is land that's not managed very well, um, where we can improve the management, of it, but it's still something that we can be proud of. And this is something that's not done ju by just a few individuals, you know, arguing at a, at a hearing or in a meeting or buying up some land. This represents a societal commitment when you're saving half of the land in one of the one of the world's most expensive real estate markets it's telling you that the people care and it gives me a lot of hope for how much we can get done um, when we you know when we you know when we get everyone on board and we make it not a political thing and not an argument but but something that we do together and and you know there's there's just a perspective to it all um, as I see it, there's really kind of a couple possible outcomes here. Um, we, well, without getting into possible outcomes, we're all looking at climate change as something that's gonna substantially restructure California, but climate change is why California is so diverse. As climate has warmed, so basically climate change during the Holocene has gone like this. There's been tremendous episodes of climate change. And, it's, and each time things warm, we get floristic movement of stuff moving up from the South. And then as things cool, stuff moves down from the North. And each time a wave of flora moves back and forth across the state, when it retreats, it leaves elements of itself behind. And this is a stand of trees um, on the coast, on the east shore of Tamales Bay, um, that I would drive by going to one of my nature preserves for years. And I always thought it was a grove of willows and finally got a chance to get out to the site, to, to botanize the site for trying to uh, buy it and permanently protect it. And as we got closer with Peter Bay, actually, um, we could see that they weren't willows, they were actually oak trees. And we thought, how weird, you know, a stand of coast live oaks out on this 100,000 year old fossil sand dune. Um, and as we got even closer, we realized they weren't coast live oaks, they were gary oaks, the kind of thing that you would expect to see more in redbud territory, that you would expect to see inland where it's cold and where you have extremes of climate and not right on the shore um, across from Point Reyes National Seashore. And then we realized that that's what we were looking at that we were looking at a stand of Gary Oaks that had been there since that was inland. Since you know, 15,000 years ago, the Farallon Islands um, were part of the mainland. And, and, and these trees were inland during a colder, cooler climate. And that they, that they had been hanging on on this fossil sand dune all that time. Um, while sea level rose at an incredible rate, really fast, about as fast as we're predicting sea level is going to rise over the next little while, sea level went up and isolated the Farallon Islands. During a time period when there were humans here, we're talking from, from 15,000 years to 9,000 years ago, there were people there. There were people whose ancestors had collected acorns on the Farallons and then couldn't anymore because they were too far offshore. They couldn't walk to the Farallons anymore. There were people here during that transition. Um, and so the, the pace of change, the, the time scale of change is really interesting. And, and, 
And, um, and I think we need to keep that in mind. If we don't Venus the place, if we don't sterilize it, life will go on. And to a large degree, we just can't predict what it's going to be. And, and another little bit of perspective that, that I get that I like to think back on is many of my colleagues pull data off CalFlora or wherever and do, um, and do uh, bioclimatic envelope modeling to model the distributions of plants in the future under hypothetical climate change scenarios. And, and I emphasize hypothetical because we really don't know where climate's gonna go. It could get a lot colder after, you know, there's a climate war between Russia and China and China's trying to cool things down to save their interior and Russia's pumping stuff into the atmosphere to warm up the North. We just don't know what the future holds. But if you assume that things are gonna get warmer, um, and then you do some modeling, the modeling will tell you that not only are redwoods going to go extinct in the future, but they're actually extinct today because there's no climate appropriate zones for them left anymore. Um, and you have stuff like that. And we, we, we can put a lot of credence into our models and tend to forget the reality that we're exposed to when we actually get outside. And so this is one of the few redwood seedlings that I've ever seen in my life. As a guy who went to college in the redwoods and has spent spent 10 years managing redwood forests, um, I haven't seen a lot of seedlings. They don't come up from seed a lot. And this seedling is in a planter box in front of the office in Sacramento, across the street from big old redwood trees that are growing in the state park, in the, the, the um, Sutter's Fort State Park, um, without any added water, just growing off groundwater in a place where they could never grow. There's no way redwood coast redwoods can occur in Sacramento, and yet they do. And they're seeding out and growing in, in these strange habitats where the understory of this planter box is actually the strawberries that you would find on the coast. And, and so this just reminds me that these things are so unpredictable and so crazy, and they got such a life force um, that, that really we can't assume anything about them. We just need to, I think the only thing that we can assume is that they are going, they're, it's going to be hard to kill them and we don't have to do extraordinary things. We don't have to give up on them and, and try and save greenness and give up on species. Any of these dramatic steps are probably overkill. The main thing that we have to do is not bulldoze them. If we don't bulldoze them, there's a good chance they're gonna figure out how to persist for another 10 million years. Um, so that's my message there. I do feel that ultimately, if we don't Venus this planet, life will recover. And someday, um, someday it will be back to wild. And, and I got a couple photos, you know, one is, you know, this is, you know, you can imagine this site, this is what it looked like a million years ago. And this is what it will look like a million years from now. It will be wild again, it will be beautiful again. The only question is, are we gonna keep it that way while we are here, while humans are on this planet? Are we going to get the benefits of beautiful, biodiverse wild landscapes? Are our descendants and our children and everyone else going to get to get out into places like this and heal? Are they gonna be able to go out and pull the DNA off of these things and find a cure for the new disease that's getting them or a, or a gene that lets them grow food under a different kind of climate regime? Are we going to have the benefit of, of living with these beautiful things? I'm confident that they will come back if we wipe them out. Um, I'm, I'm not so worried about them. I'm just worried about, about us. And so that's why I'm in it. I think that, you know, that, um, well, anyway, that's our planet. So, um, I guess the take home is that this is what we're fighting for. Um, I said all of, those, all of those comments were predicated on, you know, there's a couple scenarios. One scenario is we don't Venus the planet and life persists and, it, and, if, and if it does, it will recover. The other scenario is that we Venus the planet, that we have runaway greenhouse effects, that we, that we emit, 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 and we trigger the methane clath rates and the, the permafrost carbon, and we put too much carbon in the atmosphere and, and a chunk of the oceans boil and it sterilizes the planet. And, and so really this is what we're fighting for to a certain extent. It's absolutely insane that we could be thinking in those terms that um, you know, when we look at petitioning for endangered species status of the Joshua tree, it seems ridiculous. Joshua trees are so widespread, but you know, unfortunately, it's not ridiculous to think that any, any species on the planet could be endangered. That really the, you know, the future of life on the only habitable planet that we know about is actually in, in the cards. And so this is what we're fighting for. Um, you know, when I look at this, I think in the future, they'll look at this and go, oh my God, you guys had so much ice. You had so much snow. Um, 
um, this is what we're fighting for. And so it's worth great sacrifices, worth wearing ourselves out. Um, it's worth, you know, in the cities, it's worth having a high rise, uh, take up all, you know, take up, a, take up a parking lot. It's worth having less parking um, or even more traffic or more people living around you um, for us to be able to continue living on this planet. And, um, and that's what I'm working for. So that's my talk. Um, I'd really like to, I hope there's a few minutes for comments. I'd really like to hear what you think. Um, and then here's my email. So I hope you'll, you'll write me with ideas, suggestions, advice, um, critiques, that kind of stuff. Thank you. Is there anyone there? Yes, sorry about that. Okay. This is Jean. I was, I was, I was double muted, so I am now talking again. Oh, I don't know. Um, thank you, Dan, very much, and we welcome um, questions um, in the chat. And then our moderator, Chrissy, will be um, relaying those to Dan for his response. And we just really appreciate hearing from you and your perspective. So, Chrissy, you have any questions for Dan? There you I are. have to unmute. I had to unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, we do have a question. Um, has C from Elaine. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dan. And has CNPS reached out to or partnered with California's Indigenous peoples to enlist their participation? It seems as the as if the original and very successful stewards of the land, their traditional ecological knowledge would be critical to the success of CNPS's initiative. Good question, Elaine. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yes, uh, let me think about how to answer it. I mean, the answer is yes, yes, no, yes, yes. Um, uh, I actually absolutely, I think we all absolutely understand and agree with that sentiment. Um, if you've been reading Fremontia and Flora, I think you've, you've seen, you know, strong evidence uh, where we're really trying to not just, um, you know, acknowledge that, but really provide a platform for folks, uh, for indigenous communities to be able to talk about it. And, We've actually got some upcoming issues that are going to blow your blow your mind. Hopefully, um, I would say that you know it is quite challenging. Um, here we are, um, still recovering from a near genocide, and one consequence of that is you know one consequence of genocide is that there are fewer people left, and and so Native communities in California are outnumbered by the by the immigrants who now really want to partner with them and talk to them. And, and so that is a challenge and we try to be very mindful of that. And, and so we, we are, I think CNPS, um, I think uh, I can tell you that CNPS staff and our projects and our programs are very well connected and integrated with a number of tribes and with individuals who are working on you know, traditional practices around California. We have good connections and good relationships. And we're also respectful of the fact that, um, you know, that our friends are have a lot of people asking for them to you know provide advice, uh, whatever it might be, engage in a variety of different ways, and so we haven't reached out as much. Um, we you know it, except in special cases, for example, you know a Fremontia focusing on indig indigenous uh, management practices, you have to reach out for that um, and things like that. Um, we've been fortunate that really we've been contacted uh, more than more than we're more than asking for help we are being asked for help which is uh, that is the way it should be um and and so that's especially um we you know have a long list of projects in southern california that we've been working on um with uh, folks from uh palma valley band pala band uh, uh pachanga uh uh, uh Akumie, um uh uh, Santa Rosa Cahuila, um, another Cahuila band, uh, a number of bands and tribes in Southern California have reached out to us on various projects. Um, so Santa Rosa Cahuila wanted our help doing rare plant treasure hunts and we provided that. Palma Valley uh, wanted help putting in native plant gardens and we gave help. Um, Pachanga um, reached out to us to ask for advice on, on developing their own seed bank. Um, and, we, and we partnered with them on that. Um, uh, Pala Band, has been a great partner across a whole number of projects. Um, they got Fish and Wildlife Service funding to do wetland delineation. And so we, we provided training workshops uh, to train personnel in wetland delineation 
And then we also did we're playing treasure hunts for them on an, a different grant and stuff like that. And I feel really good about that. I really feel like CNPS needs to be a resource um, as much as possible. Um, we need to learn um, and, and we need to learn and share what we learn back out. Um, but, but we don't want to be yet another hungry mouth asking, you know, saying, hey, we've seen the light and now can you help us? Um, and so that's a difficult balance. That said, um, simply waiting passively is not enough. And so we have ideas of how we can better serve and be a better resource um, and support better. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think I've answered the whole question, but maybe there's enough there for a follow-up question or something. That was, that was very good. That was, that, that, that was great. Uh, Elaine responds, awesome to hear they're reaching out. I understand the sensitivity needed for it to go the other way. Thanks. Um, and uh, for anyone, there is uh, a, uh, uh, a link that Jean has provided in the chat uh, that said, in which she says, please see this site to find out how we can help the local Nusenan people. So uh, take a look at that, nevadacityrancheria.org. Uh, Diane has a question for you, Dan. Uh, what a great overview of the issues we face throughout California. Do you have a specific recommendation for Placer and Nevada counties? A specific recommendation for what? For our two counties, Placer and Nevada counties. Uh-huh. Well, you know, um, and you know, forgive me, I. My job is to make sure that staff are working on the most important stuff and, and supporting chapters and volunteers. And so coming from that perspective, what I see um, in your counties, uh, and, and so I'm just gonna say a little bit, and then I wanna hear from you whether I'm on the right track or whether there's other stuff. But my biggest concerns are around uh, the interaction of fire, fuels management, and forestry. And, and then also, um, uh, development. And those are all fully integrated, you know, across the arc. Um, uh, and, and there's, and there's big opportunities. It's really exciting to see um, at this time, people talking about how we can live with fire in a different way. And, um, and revisiting the degree to which we allow uh, developments to occur in areas that we know are going to um, have catastrophic wildfires. Um, and when we talk with legislators, you know, they will, they will bring up things like, well, you know, at what point do we stop building in places like paradise and, and things like that? And there's no easy solutions, um, but I am mindful of, you know, you know, John Kerry before the Senate um, with his famous line of, you know, how do you ask someone to be the last person to die for, for a, a war that they shouldn't be in? Um, someone can remember the quote better than I. And I think to a certain degree, we realize that we cannot live in fire prone areas the way we have going forward. We all know that we can't tell people they have to move out, that we've got you know, sunken assets and we've got communities that are there, but we don't have to double down on them in the same way. We do have to change the way we do that. And it's great to hear um, the least likely people talking about. Um, Cal Fire Director Kim Pimlock, on his, you know, last week in his position as he left, um, dropped a bombshell saying that Californians have to change that. Uh, Ken, I do wish you had said that at any point in your career before your, your retirement party, um, but, it, but he said it. And I think that's one place that we're heading. We have a great opportunity here for CMPS to be able to move that forward. Um, we're investing, you know, on those lines, we're investing tremendous money in fuel management and um, to reduce fire risk and, and hopefully improve forest health. And those are not necessarily the same thing, but they can be. And part of, part of that is that, you know, we plan the projects well and we do pre-project surveys and we have botanists on site where there's sensitive resources to make sure that they don't get taken out along with the, with, you know, the, 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 the fuel that is being removed. And I think that that is something that we're not doing now that we need to invest in. So I think, um, so I think, you know, thinking about development and, and how, how we want to, how we want to go do it going forward. And then also think about fuel management and how CNPSers can contribute to making sure that fuel management projects don't hurt the, the conservation targets and do improve forest health. I think those are really key. Tell me if I'm wrong. 
I, I think those, I, I would just say that I think those two issues are um, very, uh, very much at the forefront of what people here in these counties are thinking about. Uh, certainly, uh, there are development issues going on in both counties that uh, Redbud has been involved with. Jean, I think you could speak to that. Uh, and have been working on that, as have a number of other people. And uh, we certainly with a significant fire going on in Nevada County right now, uh, we are very conscious and have been conscious of the question of, of fuels management and, and, uh, and, and, and healthy, healthy forests. Um, and and how, to, how to educate uh, Cal Fire, the general public, ourselves on how those two can be the same. And that's an interesting question is how can we, as a Redbud chapter, um, increase that general public knowledge about how those two things can be the same? We did just have a public uh, program uh, with someone who was excellent. He's both a, a long time uh, a CNPS member and a Cal Fire Battalion Chief. And there are not that many people who fit that Venn diagram. So he has been a tremendous person for us to have uh, on board and he's spoken several times. But uh, beyond that, you know, what can we do? How do we help mm -hmm. improve that? And also, how do we, this is the second question, I know I'm asking you two questions. The second question is, how do we truly light a fire to get, and I know this, metaphorically, please, light a fire to inspire more people to volunteer for conservation advocacy on things like development issues mm -hmm. through yeah. Redbud or elsewhere. It's like, how do you get people to actually do something? Write letters, go out, you know, do something about these issues. What, yeah. have, been, what have been effective methods that other chapters have used? Yeah, yeah. Um, if I, I don't know how much time I have. I, I would like to get into that. <laughs> if, go, go for if that. If you're able to indulge me. Um, you know, there's a global context there that's really hard. And, you know, 20 years ago when I started, you know, I spent 10 years managing nature preserves in Marin and Sonoma, 31 properties. And it, they, it was volunteer-led programs. And at that time, there was a lot of talk about the changing face of volunteerism. And uh, there was a lot of you know, scholarly analysis done um, and volunteerism was changing. CNPS was formed by a, a different kind of volunteer than the typical volunteer today. Um, I mean, literally it was formed by the, by, um, the incredibly well-educated housewives who are married to Nobel physicists and Nobel prize winning chemists here in Berkeley, um, who, you know, were brilliant women with um, great educations and time on their hands because it was an era when, you know, it, it was a different era. And 20 years ago, volunteerism was changing because um, it was clear that people needed to work more and people still wanted to volunteer and make a difference, but they needed to be able to do it in short segments. They could go out and volunteer for a habit habitat restoration work day once, or maybe, you know, once a month or something like that, but it had to be a few hours here and there. It, is, it, it has transformed even further to where volunteerism today, I think probably the vast majority of volunteerism today, and I think probably the amount of hours being given by volunteers has gone up probably an order of magnitude. And it's all going to Facebook. People are in there generating content for Facebook. They're doing something that Facebook could never pay for. And as a result, Facebook and other corporations are getting really wealthy because we are all volunteering for them, writing stuff, building stuff, creating stories, networking, making it interesting. Um, and as a consequence, all of our time and focus is going into that stuff. And, and so, it is, going, it is really hard to have substantive volunteer hours going into anything else in that environment. So I just wanna establish that as something that I recognize that we cannot depend, we, we can, 
that it is going to be hard to expect people who are working multiple jobs with huge challenges and, and you know, and, a, and an addictive communications platform to also be able to carry the conservation work that we need to do. And so I'm trying to think about how, how, how staff and the statewide organization can create a system that gives people the ability to, to make a contribution no matter what they're able, no matter what their limitations are. And so we're brainstorming that right now. We are, that is the number one thing that we are working on in CNPS right now. It's a tough contest, but I think it's probably number one. Thinking about how to build the new conservation program. We built out the rare plant and vegetation program. We've got um, more than a dozen scientists doing great work. That's really solid. Habitat revolution is moving forward really well. We've got a great team. It's got a good head of steam, it's going well. And now I am focusing on conservation. And so we've had some little strategic retreats where all the conservation chairs brainstorm ideas and we got some really good ideas out of that. One was that we needed another conservation analyst and so we hired one. We got lucky and hired um, Isabella Langon. Uh, she left her job in the law firm and she's now working for CNPS. Uh, she's been in, I think a month and she's doing fantastic work. So conservation chairs, we heard you, check. We got that one done but there's a lot more that needs to be done. Right now we're scoping the conservation toolbox, which is intended to be a system, a system, a framework, a platform with tools in it that supports chapters and volunteers. And that's, that's not just in supporting the folks who are already doing stuff and are overwhelmed, but also provide a system and a framework that allows us to recruit new people to help and, and to make sure that they stick. That when we get someone coming in saying, I wanna help, there's a there there. There's someone to respond back and say, that is great. And here's a simple thing that you can do. And then can say, you did that really well. Um, you want to do this one and really, you know, get them to stick so that we're not, so that there isn't any kind of attrition that when we do get lucky and get someone who can invest time, we've got them. And then have other things that all of us can do, even if we've only got a few minutes or a few hours um, episodically. And so that's what we're trying to do to support volunteers. Part of that is, you know, technical infrastructure. Part of it is staffing infrastructure. And so I'm, I'm spending a lot of time trying to think really broadly about how um, I'm committed to expanding the staffing on conservation and somehow finding the funding for it. And at the same time, I'm trying to figure out what they will be doing that is most effective in supporting volunteers, in bringing new people in, in training them so that they're, they can be productive immediately. Um, and then in leveraging that productivity. And, mm -hmm. and part of the leverage means that we need to get more serious about litigation. CNPS has always done litigation. It's the last resort when our comments fail and our appeals fail and the project is still a bad project. Um, there are times when we have to litigate and it's been done in an ad hoc fashion typically. We're not always strategic. It's been driven by chapters and so limited by the capacity uh, of chapters where you know, quite often it's just one individual carrying the conservation issues for a huge county. Um, and so we need to do better litigation. And so we're building a model on that and um, that will support chapters in taking on the litigation that they need to do. And also allow us to engage in litigation that here and there is strategic where we're looking for the right lawsuit that will help us to establish, for example, that you know the law requires timber harvest plans to, you know, there is CEQA equivalency. They have to be CEQA equivalent. Well, they suck. They typically, they are not equivalent and it's time for a case to slap someone down and establish that precedent. And, and we need a litigation program that can look for that case. And then when we find it has the resources to win it and establish the precedent so that it changes the whole system. Um, so that's some of what we're doing. And that conservation stuff gets to all of the other issues that I talked about with regard to your chapter. It is essential right now. We're long overdue to be doing a better job of saving places and it's gonna get a lot worse really fast. I saw a graph of lumber prices the other day over the like the last two years the price of lumber, like two by fours, has doubled. Um, and, and especially very recently in the last two to three months. And, and, um, and apparently you cannot get them. And I don't mean that you can't go to Home Depot and get them, but Home Depot can't get them. You can go and buy whatever inventory they have. But Lenar, when they're lit, rolling out another 1,000 houses, put their order for lumber in well in advance. And the, and the mills, they're not accepting orders. They're booked full. 
they, you know, it's, they are at capacity, which is of course limited right now. And that is a reflection of the fact that we're seeing the beginning of a tidal wave of development that is only going to expand. We just, you know, um, set a few more trillion dollars out into the system and that's going into private equity um, and, and corporations that are going to be putting that money onto the ground. Just that money alone is gonna stimulate development and growth. And it's gonna be in an environment in which a lot of people have lost jobs and the economy for most people sucks. So we're gonna have a terrible combination of a ton of capital, a ton of equity money looking for a return on investment and, a, and an environment in which people can just say, you have to build that new city because jobs. Um, and that will be, and that's kind of a best case scenario. Another scenario is we also get um, a, a government in DC that wants to do a Green New Deal and wants to stimulate growth in the right things and wants to put solar panels over the entire desert and put windmills on every hill um, to generate renewable energy. And, and so I am bracing for a tidal wave of projects. Some of them good projects that just need us to guide them toward improving, to move the windmill a little to the left so it doesn't drive that thing extinct. But many of them bad projects like Gwenock Valley, look it up, G-U-E-N-O-C, 25 square miles of serpentine habitat in the boonies, east of Middletown, north of Napa County, where they're gonna put in hundreds, or I can't remember, might be a thousand resort homes with three heliports. Can it's right now on fire. Could you spell that again? G-U-E-N-O-C. Yeah, G-U-E-N-O-C. I'm quite focused on that because it's, it's all just coming together on Gwinnock right now. And we have to file our lawsuit in the next few days. So we're working on it. They, okay. they, they pushed that thing through during the pandemic deliberately to minimize or, or basically eliminate public interaction. Most of the comment letters on their plan were like, you know, the local tribe, for example, wrote in their comment le letter was, we're in week two of the lockdown. Our elders are dying. There's no possible way we can read your 700 page EIR. Will you please extend the deadline? That's their comment letter. Um, they, they took advantage of the system and, and there's going to be a lot more like that. And I'm bracing CNPS to be able to, you know, not just for CNPS to, to be able to survive the tough times that we know are going to be ahead in the next few years, but for our mission to actually, for us to be actually stronger than we've been with regard to that specific part of our mission. Dan, that was fabulous. And I think that was a really, um, you know, it gave us, gives us a sense of feeling really inspired, you know, that, uh, that, there, that, that CNPS is really paying attention to this and that um, as when you're talking about an update, which is really what this is and letting us know what CNPS is planning and thinking and what we can expect coming down the pike. Um, that the whole idea of, you know, how can we as a chapter be more effective at conservation advocacy? How can we be more effective at, you know, helping the native plants um, in our counties? Um, that CNPS is thinking about this and that there will be tools and guidance that we're gonna be able to use uh, to do this better in the time ahead is really terrific. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, you know, so we're able to do this. I just want to end by giving some thanks. We're okay. able to talk about what we're doing because CNPS is unique. We have thousands of volunteers who are doing the work. And so, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, look at the people on the on this on the screen. Um, and and so so we're able to get a huge amount of work done. And then we're also, you know, folks, we, we aren't we're an organization with a lot of folks who can write a very large check, like Nature Conservancy or something else. But we're an organization with people who have long-term commitment and, and leave CNPS, name CNPS in their estate plans, in their will, in their trust. And eventually, decades and decades later, when they, when they pass and distribute it, we put those funds into a bequest fund, which we don't spend all at once. We eke it out as part of our long-term stability. And so we have a long-term stability right now, thanks to that fund that, that is letting us stay strong over the next couple of years. And, and that's rare. I think a lot of organizations are gonna be really hard hit. And, and we're gonna be, it's gonna be hard for us, but we knew that hard times were coming and we prepared for it. And thanks to, thanks entirely to the incredible community we have, we're going to be able to make a difference during this time.
So thank you. Well, and thank you. We really hear that, Dan. And thank you so much. As 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 many of our participants have said, you know, thank you so much for your time, your passion, your action, you know, and your passion is as as they said, you know, your passion is contagious, Dan. And this is we know now, you know, from seeing you why you have the role that you do. And thank you so much for for bringing you know, this information and this energy to all of us today, you know, thank you so much for this. And we will take it to heart uh, when we go out. So thank you, Dan. And thank you everyone for coming and uh, sticking with us through the beginning to this. It was so worth it. Thank you so much, Dan. And thanks everybody on the call, on the meeting. Bye-bye.